Hi there, and welcome back to Leanne Reads, the channel where we share powerful insights and personal growth lessons through great books. For centuries, humanity has sought answers to the greatest mysteries. Where do we come from? Why are we here? And how does the universe truly work? In The Grand Design, Stephen Hawking and Leonard Maladino explore these profound questions, guiding us through quantum theory, relativity, and the very origins of the cosmos. Join me as we uncover how modern science reshapes our understanding of reality itself. If you enjoy what you hear and want to dive deeper, we've included a link to the book in the description below. Now let's get started. The Grand Design 2010 tells a fascinating story about how humanity came to be and how we began applying science to explain the world around us. From Newton's fundamental laws to Einstein's theories and quantum mechanics, the book takes us on a journey to see just how far we have come in our quest to answer life's biggest questions. Stephen Hawking 1942-2018 is regarded as one of the most important scientists of all time. He was honored with numerous prestigious awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom for 30 years. He served as the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at the University of Cambridge, where he made groundbreaking contributions to theoretical physics. He also authored several influential books, including A Brief History of Time and the Universe in a Nutshell. Leonard Mordino is a physicist at the California Inst Institute of Technology and one of the most respected experts in quantum theory. He is also the author of several best-selling books, including A Briefer History of Time co-written with Stephen Hawking. This book will help you better understand the universe, astronomy, and physics through the brilliant minds of two of the world's leading physicists. Over the past millennia, humankind has made remarkable progress in exploring the cosmos and unraveling the mysteries around us. If you were to ask a Bronze Age scientist how the universe began, he would likely respond with confidence. It was the miraculous work of the gods. This was, in fact, the most widely accepted belief for thousands of years. But today, after just a few centuries in the golden age of science, that answer has split into two camps, one rooted in mythology and the other in science. Indeed, science not only offers us compelling ideas about how the universe was formed, but also provides strong clues about how it might eventually end. If you're curious about such questions, you've come to the right place. Based on major scientific discoveries, this book serves as a spacecraft of the mind, taking you through the most memorable milestones in the history of science. Along the way, you'll gain a panoramic view of humanity's scientific journey. One of the defining traits of humanity is curiosity. For as long as we exist, we are bound to ask questions such as, Why are we here? Are we alone in this vast universe, or is there someone else out there? Was there a creator God who made us? Although these questions have been asked for thousands of years, the scientific methods used to investigate them are relatively new. In ancient times, the imagination of gods was considered the best explanation for natural phenomena. There were gods of the sun, rain, thunder, earth, and even fire. Thus, when our ancestors longed for favorable weather, they tried to please these gods. And when disasters struck, they believed they had committed sins that angered the gods. It took many millennia before ancient Greek philosophers such as Aristotle, Archimedes, and Thales began to free humanity from this mythological mindset. They devoted their lives to pondering great questions about the universe questions that lay beyond the reach of divine intervention. Today, although figures like Archimedes may not be formally recognized as scientists, in truth, he was among the first to conduct serious experiments, observations, and measurements. That is how he derived revolutionary principles such as the law of the lever. Such unorthodox thinking continued to evolve and, in the modern era, became the scientific method a rigorous system for formulating hypotheses and testing them through experiments, measurements, and observations. In the 16th and 17th centuries, scholars like Galileo Johannes Kepler and Descartes were among the first to champion this method. Isaac Newton later employed it to establish the law of gravity, which helped us understand the motion of planets and stars. Eventually, scientists came to apply the scientific method to explain the entire material world. This led to the rise of scientific determinism, the idea that technology drives the development of social structures and cultural values. For centuries, scientists have debated whether humans possess free will or whether our actions are governed by scientific laws. You might ask, wait a second, if our decisions can be explained by science, doesn't that contradict the idea of freedom? While many accept the principles of determinism when applied to nature, the question becomes far more complex when it concerns human nature. Thus, scholars have long debated the existence of free will wondering whether such a thing truly exists. To defend free will, we have the philosopher Descartes. He rejected the belief that humans are mere subjects of natural laws, like automatons following a pre-programmed script. Descartes drew a clear distinction between the human body which could be explained through scientific laws, and the soul to which such reasoning could not apply. He regarded the soul as the source of free will, even suggesting a physical location for it, the pineal gland, a small organ at the center of the brain. 
While this was a fascinating idea, it also raised bigger questions highlighting the tension between free will and scientific determinism. For instance, if humans possess free will, do other mammals also share it? If so, at what point did this trait emerge in our evolutionary journey? Is free will a characteristic of multicellular organisms, or do bacteria possess it too? Where should we draw the line between beings that follow natural laws and those with this extraordinary quality? The simple truth is that no such boundary exists, though it may be comforting to believe we have the freedom to choose any action we wish. In reality, all our thoughts and decisions can be explained by the laws of physics and chemistry. Recent advances in neuroscience have shed light on this. Scientists now know which regions of the brain can be stimulated to trigger the desire to speak or move. Thus, all human choices can now be explained by biological mechanisms just as everything else in the universe can be explained. What do you think about a goldfish living in a bowl? It might seem trivial, but surprisingly, this became a real concern in the Italian city of Monza. In 2004, the city council banned the use of curved fish bowls, arguing that the glass distorts the fish's view, forcing the poor creatures to live in a cruelly warped world. But for such a humanitarian gesture to hold meaning, we would first have to prove that our own standard is correct, that the world we see is indeed the real one, free of distortion. That assumption is, in fact, arrogant. The truth is that we all perceive the world based on human standards. In other words, there is no reality apart from individual experience. What you call reality is merely a mental image your brain constructs from sensory data. Take for example the sight of a tree. What you actually see is the illusion your brain creates from the light reflecting off its surface and striking your retina. That mental image not the tree itself is what you perceive. So why do we trust these illusions so strongly? The answer is simple. Scientists are humans too, sharing the same sensory framework. That means the scientific laws they formulate laws we accept as universal are based on the same kind of perception we all share. Because our vision aligns with these laws, we assume the illusions we see must correspond to reality. This is why we conclude that the world a goldfish sees through curved glass is inaccurate. But imagine if the goldfish conducted experiments of its own, establishing a set of rules to explain the world it experiences. The results would differ from ours, not because they are wrong, but because the curved glass bends its observations along arcs instead of straight lines. Still, within the fish's context, those laws would represent its own version of reality. In short, we should not compare our experiences with those of other creatures. Each has its own perspective of the world, and though different, each perspective is a legitimate reflection of lived experience. It is important to remember that everything is relative, but this does not mean that all old theories or outdated models are equally valid. There are four criteria that every good model of reality should meet. First, it should be concise. Admittedly, this is somewhat subjective, but in science, most experts agree that a good model makes an extremely complex subject appear simple. Einstein's famous formula, E equals mic, is perhaps the perfect example of conciseness in science. Einstein himself advised that scientists should strive for theories that are as simple as possible, but not simpler. Second, a good theory should not rely on too many adjustable or random factors. If a theory requires endless modifications to accommodate new data, it is a sign of weakness. For instance, early astronomers believed everything revolved around Earth in perfect circles, but later observations contradicted this idea, forcing them to add layer upon layer of new assumptions. The Roman mathematician and astronomer Ptolemy proposed that planets move in small, individual circles epicycles around Earth. While this patched the theory to match observations, it revealed that the original model was flawed. Third, a good model must account for all existing observations. Take Newton's theory of light. He believed light was made up of particles what he called corpuscles. This explained why light travels in straight lines and why it refracts in water. However, his theory could not explain why light sometimes produces concentric rings when reflected between two surfaces behavior more consistent with waves than particles. Because it failed to explain this phenomenon, Newton's model of light could not stand as a complete scientific law. Finally, the fourth criterion is that any good theory must not only explain current observations but also contribute to predicting future ones. So far, most of what we've considered can be observed with the naked eye and largely explained. But if we could see what happens at the subatomic level where quantum theory rules things would no longer be so simple. One of the most important principles in quantum physics is the uncertainty principle. Established in 1926 by German physicist Werner Heisenberg, Heisenberg argued that it is impossible to measure both the position and the velocity of a particle at the same time. For example, if you attempt to reduce a particle's speed to zero, you lose the ability to determine its position and vice versa. With countless possibilities, we cannot predict exactly where a particle has been or where it will be in the future. The best we can do is measure the probabilities of its different possible positions. Another key principle of quantum theory is that we cannot passively observe something. In other words, by actively observing, we inevitably affect what we are observing. 
Consider the act of opening a refrigerator to check what's inside. By doing so, you change the internal temperature and expose the food to photons of light. While shining light on something as large as an apple may not alter much, those photons' particles of light can collide with and significantly disturb the tiny particles that make up the apple. This disruption makes quantum-level experiments far more difficult. In essence, once we observe and measure, the state of the particles has already changed. In 1905, at just 26 years old, Albert Einstein made several groundbreaking contributions to physics. Through the theory of relativity, he demonstrated that our experience of time itself is relative. To understand this, imagine you are in the cockpit of an airplane traveling at nearly the speed of light. A continuous beam of light shines from the plane down to the ground. From your perspective inside the plane, the light travels straight down. But from the viewpoint of someone standing on the ground, watching the plane zoom past, the light travels at an angle. So far, this makes sense. But here's where it gets tricky. The speed of light is the same for everyone, regardless of motion. Whether you are moving at 10 miles per hour or 10,000 miles per hour, light will always travel at 186,000 miles per second. That means, although the speed of light is identical for both you and the observer on the ground, your perception of distance differs. Consequently, according to the formula speed equals distance time, your perception of time must also differ. In other words, the faster you move, the more slowly time passes for you compared to someone standing still. Einstein's general theory of relativity further changed the game by explaining how gravity works. He proposed that our universe is a fabric woven from both space and time, which is why it is called space-time. You can picture space-time as the surface of a billiard table. Without gravity, the table remains flat, and objects move freely across it. But gravity acts like a heavy weight placed in the center, bending the surface and creating a dip. As a result, smaller objects are pulled toward the center and move in orbits around it. This is how the gravitational force of a massive star like the Sun keeps the planets in orbit around it. Today, there are many theories explaining how different aspects of nature work, such as gravity and quantum particles. However, these separate theories don't always align well with one another. For instance, quantum theory and general relativity remain difficult to reconcile. This has been the great struggle of physicists for generations. The first step was the grand unified theory gut, which aimed to unite three of the four fundamental forces of nature. The weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, and electromagnetism. The final fundamental force is gravity. However, all attempts to build a gut have failed as experiments continue to disprove the predictions. For example, in the 1970s, physicists predicted that protons would decay with an average lifetime of 10 years. More recent experiments, however, have shown the true rate to be greater than 10 years. Still, the idea of a unifying theory has not been abandoned, and theory may be the long-sought answer. Unlike traditional approaches, M-theory is not a single theory but rather a framework that unites multiple theories into one grand picture. You might think of it like an atlas composed of many individual maps. Each map offers a partial view, but only when combined do they reveal the full landscape. One of the most fascinating aspects of M-theory is that it opens the possibility of multiple universes. And as we'll see in the next chapter, our universe itself may have come into existence through sheer luck. Our existence in the universe has always been a mystery just as mysterious as the existence of the universe itself. For centuries, questions about the universe's origins were divided into two schools of thought, one rooted in science and the other in mythology. Only recently has modern science developed the tools to explain how the universe began, and why it is expanding all in accordance with natural laws. In 1929, American astronomer Edwin Hubble discovered that nearly all galaxies are moving away from Earth. He also noted that the farther they are, the faster they move. From this, he concluded that the universe is expanding, and if something is expanding it must once have been smaller. Indeed, scientists can trace the expansion backward to a point where all matter and energy were compressed into an unimaginably dense and hot state. They believe this was the condition of the universe just before the Big Bang. After the Big Bang Earth was extraordinarily fortunate to find itself with the right conditions for life. Our planet resides in what scientists call the habitable zone, the perfect distance from the Sun. To avoid deadly extremes and catastrophic asteroid impacts, thanks to this ideal distance, water on Earth's surface is neither too hot nor too cold. However, People from various religious traditions have argued that this position was not luck at all, but rather the result of divine intelligent design. Yet, believing that God created the universe only leads to more questions such as, who created God? For most astronomers, physicists and scientific thinkers, divine beings are not the explanation for our existence. Instead, it is the outcome of a remarkable combination of factors at its core, simply luck. For thousands of years, humanity placed its faith in divine mysteries. But only in the past few centuries has science significantly diminished that reliance. We have even gone further discovering the origins of the universe and shedding, 
light on age-old questions that have long haunted us, yet many profound mysteries remain unsolved. These unanswered questions will continue to drive science forward, inspiring future generations to seek the truth. Reading the grand design was both humbling and mind-expanding. Hawking and Melodino do not simply present physics as a collection of abstract theories. Instead, they reveal it as a human journey or relentless quest to understand why we are here and how the universe came to be. What struck me most is how the book challenges our deepest assumptions about reality. The idea that free will may be an illusion, or that what we call reality is nothing more than the brain's interpretation of sensory data, is unsettling yet profoundly thought-provoking. It forces us to question not only the universe outside us, but also the universe within. Equally fascinating is the discussion of quantum theory and relativity, the uncertainty principle, the role of the observer, and the strange fabric of space-time all show that the universe is far stranger and far more beautiful than our everyday intuition allows. And then comes the bold suggestion of M-theory, with its possibility of multiple universes. Whether or not this is the ultimate theory of everything, it gives us a glimpse of just how vast and mysterious reality may be. What I admire about this book is that it doesn't pretend to have all the answers. Instead, it shows us the power of curiosity, the same curiosity that has driven humanity for millennia. Even as science explains more, it opens new frontiers of wonder and new questions for the generations ahead. For me, the grand design is not just about physics, it is about perspective. It reminds us of our smallness in the cosmic scale, but also of the remarkable ability of the human mind to reach beyond itself, to imagine, to question, and to discover. In the end, the greatest lesson I take from this book is that science is not the enemy of wonder. On the contrary, it deepens it. To look at the stars through the lens of science is not to rob them of mystery, but to appreciate even more the extraordinary story they tell. We've only scratched the surface of the questions Hawking and Modern Arrays in the grand design. What if our universe is just one among many? What if reality itself is an illusion? If these questions excite you as much as they excite me, make sure to subscribe, because we'll keep exploring books that push the boundaries of human thought, and if you want the full experience, get the book. Link in description below it might just change the way you see everything.